If you have your Bibles today, and you would open them with me to Matthew, the 8th chapter. Matthew, the 8th chapter. We're going to begin this afternoon at verse number 5. And we will read through verse number 13. Matthew, the 8th chapter. Beginning at verse 5 and reading through verse number 13. And the King James text today reads as follows. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into our outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Hallelujah. Want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Point Underdog. Hallelujah. Point Underdog. One more time, let's go to the Lord. Master, we love you, and your word is precious to our hearts. We understand the surety, the absolute confidence that the people of God have been called to place in this sacred text today. And it is from the word of God that we glean inspiration to fight the fight one more day. It is from the word of God that we glean our authority, that we get our power. It is from the preached word of God that our faith is made to grow and flourish. Anoint today the speaker. Help me, Lord. Help me, help me, help me to preach this message for this moment in time, for this hour, for your people. Help me to deliver it in such a way that the people of God will readily be able to receive it. Let the sinner receive it as well, the unbeliever, that one who has never walked in relationship with you. Let them not hear with their hearing alone, but let their heart today be tuned in to receive that which the Spirit of the Lord speaks to His church. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. Praise God and amen. There are precious few figures 
in the first century who were more hated and despised by the Jewish people than those who represented the Roman occupation of Palestine, that land today which we call Israel. There were few that the Jewish people looked upon with less contempt and hatred and vitriol than those who worked for the Roman government who assured that the nation of Israel remained under the heavy hand of Roman occupation and they did not know what it was to live freely. They did not know what it was to practice their religion without interference or observation or obstruction. The Romans were probably the least popular people living in the land of Israel at, the, at this time in human history. And yet it was a Roman centurion who came to Jesus and called him Lord, declaring to him that he had a servant at home who was sick with the palsy greatly tormented and he asked of Jesus that the Lord might heal him interestingly enough the Lord responded very differently to this Roman than he did to many I'm going to tell you something God knows how to respond to you God knows exactly how to elicit from you that which he wants to hear. There is a reason the Lord responded to this centurion as he did normally in many instances when someone would come to the Lord and ask him to heal one who was far away, one who was not present, one who was not with them. The Lord would oftentimes say, go your way. There, your faith has healed them. Am I telling the truth? But for some reason in this particular story, the Lord decided to respond to this centurion differently. And to this centurion he said, I will come and heal him. Now we know from past experiences that Jesus did not have to be present to heal anybody. There were many that he said, go your way, go, they're healed, they're okay, go check them out, amen. He didn't have to go to every circumstance. He didn't have to be in uh, every place and every time to secure a healing or to minister a healing. And yet to the centurion, Jesus said, I will come and heal him. I believe the divinity, I believe God in Christ knew exactly how this centurion's mind worked. I believe he gave this response, he reacted in this way in order to garner a specific reaction from this centurion. He knew this centurion was a humble man. For the centurion responded to him, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. The Lord knew this is a humble man. But he also knew this is a man with more faith than most. <laughs> he said, just watch how he reacts when I say to him, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion went into a great speech, a dissertation of such, explaining to the Lord, listen, if anybody on this planet understands the concept of authority, I get it. 
I am not only in the line of authority from Rome, not only am I under those who have authority over me, but at the same time I have men under me who are under my authority. I can say to one, go do this and he'll do it. I can say to another, come here and he'll come. He said, I can tell my servant, I want you to get this done. And by golly, they'll get it done. He said, I understand authority. He said, I also know you don't need to come to my house. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. He said, I know you don't have to come to my house. He said, you've got authority. Glory to God. He said, you've got authority that transcends any authority I'll ever have. He said, all you got to do is speak the word. Glory to God. He said, all you got to do is say it because your authority stretches out and it, it literally touches demons your authority is able to touch sickness and disease your authority is able to be exercised simply through the word of your mouth who else do we know from the word of God who's able to create and destroy with nothing more than the word of his mouth I'll tell you who he's called Jehovah in the Old Testament he's called Jesus in the New and we call him God hallelujah Woo! and that centurion said to the Lord <laughs> you've got the authority of the divine you've got supreme authority you don't have to be somewhere to make something happen all you've got to do is say the word oh hallelujah oh praise the name of the Lord and the Lord responded to this man's humility he responded to this man's declaration of faith By saying this, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Hallelujah. Oh, point underdog. Hallelujah. When you're watching a tennis match and they're playing, when one of the... Uh, the athlete scores you'll hear the one who's overseeing the match declare point and they point to the side that has scored the point and in this instance the Lord is saying you got the church over here you got the religious over here you got those who call themselves believers you got those that call themselves righteous you have got those that call yourself holy he said and over here you got a poor Roman centurion that all you people can't stand that all you people hate with every fiber of your being but at the moment I haven't found faith in anybody on that side like I found on that side point underdog hallelujah I want to tell you today my friend if you think you're being an underdog if you think today that just because you're hated and despised by the religious by the zealots by the self-righteous if you think you have no ability to touch the heart of God you're mistaken oh hallelujah the underdog can score oh I want you to know the word of God doesn't just give us one example of an underdog finding his or her way to the heart of God and receiving from the Lord that which they need. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 22 through 28, 
we read the following, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she answered and said, and, and she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O oh woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Oh, I want to tell you today, sometimes the underdog can score. Sometimes the underdog gets the point. In our first story this afternoon, it was a Roman centurion, a hated, a despised Roman figure in the land of occupied Israel. Now we have a woman, the word of God declares, of Canaan who came to the Lord seeking help, and he just over and over and over again kept brushing her aside. But she persisted. Finally, oh, I'm going to tell you, I wish the church would get this sometime. Finally, she figured out, I know how to get his heart. I know how to get him to stop him for a minute. And the word of the Lord says, finally, she came and worshipped him. Got news for you, Jehovah's Witness. If Jesus had only been a man that God created for the purpose of dying on the cross and yada, yada, yakety, yak, this would have been heresy and God would not have permitted it. The word of God declares plainly, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him alone shalt thou serve. Jesus received Worship. When people came and worshiped at his feet, he accepted it. He never rejected it. He never told them, don't worship me, I'm but a man. Peter did, John did, but Jesus didn't. Hallelujah. So your doctrine is false and foul. You think Jesus was anything short of God? You don't know your Bible very well. <sighs> Who on earth were the Canaanites? This woman was a Canaanite. According to the word of God, Canaanites descended from Noah's grandson, whose name was Canaan. Canaan was cursed through his father Ham, after Ham, who was the son of Noah, got drunk and saw his father naked, if you recall, in his tent in Genesis 9, 18 through 24. Therefore, the Canaanite people were descendants of Canaan, who was a son of Ham, who was a son of Noah, who had been cursed. These people were a cursed people. That's why at first Jesus just ignored her. That's why at first Jesus didn't want anything to do with her. No, no, honey, you're part of a cursed body of people. You're part of a cursed lineage. We read the word Canaan 
throughout the Word of God as a geographically associated term with the promised land. However, Canaanites serves as an ethnic catch-all covering various indigenous populations, both settled and nomadic pastoral groups throughout the regions of the southern Levant or Canaan. Oh, the Lord had a lot of reason to pass this lady by. Lady, you're cursed. You come from a cursed lineage. The Word of God says that the entire bloodline of the sons of Ham would be cursed, not just for so many generations, but the entire bloodline throughout all of time would be cursed. This lady knew who she was. She knew how the Jewish people looked upon those who shared her lineage. But she had a need. Her daughter was grievously vexed with the devil and she knew who could help. And she was not going to let go. She was not going to uh, relent. She was going to continue to push her way into the presence of the Lord until she got what she needed. And when it was all said and done, and the Lord's final off-putting comment designed to test her, will she push further yet, even after I say to her, it is not meat. To take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. You see, the Canaanites were viewed as dogs. He just called her the N-word. Literally. That's a term she was familiar with. We're a cursed people. People look at us as though we're subhuman. They look at us as though we're dogs. That's what we're called. People would frequently refer to folks like the Canaanites as well as the Samaritans as dogs. And he said, you don't take the children's bread and throw it to a dog. She said, yea, Lord, but even the dogs get to eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. She said, you know what, Lord, I know that uh, I may not qualify for the bread, but I'll tell you, even where I'm at, I can benefit from the crumbs. Honey, I want to tell you something. God's crumbs are better than the biggest, best meal the devil ever served. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you, all you got to do is get hold of a crumb, and God can heal your body. All you got to do is get a hold of a crumb, and God can deliver you from demons. All you need is to get a hold of a crumb, and God can set you free from your addiction. All you need is get hold of a crumb, and God can save your soul sanctify fill you with the Holy Ghost and power and set you on a pathway to glory I'm here to tell you today my friend that this little lady who qualified as an underdog heard heaven declare point underdog hallelujah as Jesus declared oh woman Great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Hallelujah. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. I'm going to tell you, you know why I'm perfectly comfortable being an LGBT believer, and I'm perfectly comfortable coming into the house of God and worshiping God and doing everything in my power to live for God and to serve God, and I couldn't give a flying fig what all the people on this side of the net have to say. I don't care about the religious. I don't care about the zealots. I don't care about the scribes and Pharisees. I don't care 
about the hypocrites. I don't care about the self-righteous. I could not care less about anything they have to say. I may be an underdog, but I know that an underdog can score. Hallelujah. Because God honors our faith. This whole journey is about faith. Not about where you come from. Not about who your daddy and mama were. Not about what you're able to do or not do. No! It's about what you can believe. Can you believe the promise of God that whosoever believeth on him shall inherit everlasting life? Can you believe that or can't you? I believe it. John chapter 4. We talked about her last Sunday, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well that Jesus had an encounter with. I go further down in the story than we talked about last week. John chapter 4, verses 28 through 30, as well as verses 39 through 43. I'm doing that so we're not reading just one very, very long passage. The woman, after her meeting with Jesus, then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Oh, hallelujah. Ooh. God used a woman who'd been married five times and was living with a man she wasn't committed to to announce the arrival of Messiah to the Samaritans. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus told his disciples, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils freely. You have received freely, give. But the word of God tells us, he told them, do not go to the cities of Samaria. <laughs> What, Lord? Were you going to exclude them because of the long-standing hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans? Were you going to exclude them, Lord, because they are not full-blood Jews, but rather half-breeds, looked down upon by all of Israel, hated, despised, are you going to exclude them from the way of salvation, Lord, because of who they are? No, I just have another plan. <laughs> See, I don't want you, 12, I don't want y'all going and telling the Samaritans about the arrival of Messiah. I have other plans. What were those plans? He was going to have a meeting with a woman, a woman, a woman, a woman. Oh, God don't allow women preachers. The Word of God doesn't permit women preachers. You're full of crap. If it weren't for a woman preaching Jesus, all of Samaria would have never heard of Messiah. God purposely chose that woman at that well to be the messenger for the people of Samaria. She went to the men of the city. They then went out of the city and they came unto Jesus down to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for saying, for the saying of the woman. They believed on him because of her testimony. Hallelujah. Which testified he told me all that I ever that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. Oh, this is unheard of. The Samaritans, 
No, remember earlier when the Lord wanted to stay in a Samaritan city as he traveled toward Jerusalem. You remember? They would not accommodate him. Oh, and the sons of thunder in all their self-righteous rage wanted to call down fire from heaven to consume those cities. But no, the Lord said, you don't even know what spirit you're coming from. I've not come to destroy. We got preachers and churches today that are possessed of devils preaching a message that is hateful and harmful and horrible and they don't even realize the spirit that they have is contrary to the spirit of God because the Lord did not come to destroy but to save. The Lord said, oh no. And I'm sure in the back of his divine mind he said, trust me, I've got other plans for the Samaritans. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. Many went to Jesus and many believed on him because of the testimony of this woman. And then they did the unthinkable. They invited this Jewish man whom they now embraced as the Messiah, the Christ, to stay with them for a couple of days. See folks, I'm going to tell you something. People, human beings are stupid. To be honest, they're just plain stupid. They're, sh they're so short-sighted. We've been going through this since I opened up Club Connect and all these foolish people in this town who are wanting to have a fit because of the way we're doing things, you know, and all oh, they're just throwing a fit and they're gonna they're gonna go out of their way to close us down. They're gonna go out of their way to make sure that Club Connect is never a success in Huntsville. I don't care. I got news for you, honey. I got the money and I got the time to wait on it and I'll just move it to another location in another city don't bother me no kind of way and you'll be left with nothing just like you had before we started People are so short-sighted, Tommy. They want to act on impulse. They want to act foolishly. That's what the, thuns, the sons of thunder wanted to do. They wanted to act on impulse. They wanted to act uh, emotionally. But the Lord said, no, because you know what? You foolish dinglings, you don't know what's going to happen a month from now. You don't know what's going to happen a year from now. Instead of acting the fool because you're not getting things your way right this minute, why don't you just wait on it a little bit and see how it plays out? But you see, people of faith understand that concept. People who have no faith think that everything they see is all that anything is ever going to be. Oh my Lord have mercy. Am I telling the truth? I'm going to tell you believer, you got to be careful about looking at your situation. You got to be careful about looking at your opposition. You got to be careful about looking at the obstacle in front of you and thinking that what you're looking at now is what you're always going to be looking at. No, there's a very simple saying that goes like this. Things change the seasons change circumstances change it's amazing how many times I've heard stories of uh, people for instance who uh, bought a business or did something and at first it was failing and faltering and it was doing really poorly and they were struggling every minute of every day just to try to keep it open and then all of a sudden they decided they were going to put a road through town and guess what that road went right past their business and all of a sudden they became the most prosperous the richest the most successful people in town did they do anything to make that happen no, but something happened that caused their circumstance to change. Instead of people having a fit over how 
uh, Charles does business today, they ought to just sit back and say, well, let's see how things play out. Let's see how things go. Maybe that policy will change, or maybe this, or maybe that. You never know what's going to happen. But if you turn around and try to shut down something and ruin it so nobody can have it, well, <laughs> all you've done is hurt yourself. And you know what that guy does? He turns around and moves to another town, sets up shop, and that town isn't filled with a bunch of ding -lings, And they all say, hey, we love what he's done. And they come out and support it, and he's prosperous, and everything goes well. And there you sit. It's happened how many times? How many times have you seen it happen? But here we have the Samaritans inviting Jesus to stay with them. Oh, in one story, they were refusing to offer him accommodations. But after his meeting with the woman at the well, they were inviting him to stay. Oh, hallelujah. Things change. And many more believed because of his own word. So there were those who believed because of this woman's testimony. There were others who believed now as they heard Jesus preaching and teaching. And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, point underdog. <laughs> Hallelujah. That little Samaritan woman. Glory to God, one day she's a five times, uh, five times divorced Samaritan woman just going to get water. And later that afternoon, she's a mighty evangelist preaching the Christ, the Messiah. Oh, hallelujah, the Savior of the world. And she is responsible for multitudes of her people coming into a place of faith. Because Jesus never one time preached. You got to quit doing this. You got to quit doing that. You got to be this or you got to be that. No, his message was consistent. Whereas the modern church world's message is quite inconsistent. His message was believe. Mm -hmm. He that believeth on me, he said to the woman at the well. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Oh, hallelujah. I want to tell you today, the message, my friend, is still faith. And even the underdog can find faith. Even the underdog can exercise faith. Even the underdog can receive from God that which he offers, that which he has promised, because the message is faith. Matthew 9, 22, But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Mark 5, 34, And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Mark 10, 52, And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Luke chapter 7, verse 50, And he said to the woman, Thy faith have saved thee. Go in peace. Luke chapter 8 verse 48. And he said unto her. Daughter be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Luke chapter 8 verse 48. 
excuse me, Luke 17, verse 19. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Luke 18, 42, And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. Got news for you, friend. The message of the gospel has never changed, even though the message preached by the Southern Baptist Convention has. The message of the gospel has never changed, even though the message of the United Pentecostal Church has. The message of the gospel has never changed, even though first evangelical church's message has the message of the gospel has never changed even though the message of the assemblies of god has it's not about what you can do what you can be what you can accomplish what you can overcome it's about what you can believe hallelujah ephesians 2 8 and 9 for by grace are ye saved through faith. And I love this next phrase. And that not of yourselves. Said, See, works would be of yourself. He said, but not only are you saved by grace through faith. He said, even the faith necessary to be saved is not of yourself. No, the word of God says... When we hear the gospel and we believe, we embrace it, even the sight, the word of God said God places that seed of faith in us. So salvation is entirely, enti not a part, not a, not a large part, God's doing. No, it's entirely God's doing. He even gives us the faith that we need to believe. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Oh, I'm going to tell you, we got people who run around and they call it testimony. They call it testifying. I'm a former homosexual. I lived the life of a homosexual for many years. And then I met my wife who was also a former homosexual. And we overcame our homosexuality. And now we're living a straight husband and wife. And I just must tell you, it is the most wonderful thing and then two years later you're reading about them being caught in a gay bar hooking up with somebody because the claims they make are false you cannot change sexual orientation you can suppress it all you want to I only know because I've been there done it folks there are many of us in the community who as a believer tried to suppress it for years and you can be successful suppressing it but you know what you are you're miserable you're depressed you're unhappy you're suicidal you go through so many negative emotional uh, responses trying to suppress something that you know as good and well as anybody on this planet knows is natural to you it is innate to you. Therefore, suppressing it is literally like trying to live every day of your life fasting. You're trying to suppress your appetite. You're trying to suppress hunger every day of your life. And there are going to be some get to heaven, they think, they think, they think, and they're going to say, Oh Lord, I'm here because I was able to overcome my homosexuality. And I was able, Lord, to become straight. And that's why I'm in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, because I was able, baloney. 
Oh, Lord, I lived for you for 50 years, and in 50 years, I never allowed scissors to touch my hair. And that's why I'm in heaven, Lord, because I was so committed to you that I never cut my hair, Lord, in all those years below me. I'm here, Lord, because I was able to kick my habit. I was able to overcome my addiction to alcohol or drugs or some other substance. I was able, I was able, baloney. Got news for you, honey. There is not going to be one soul in heaven who is going to be able to say, I'm here because I. There will not be one soul in heaven, listen to me, who is going to make that five-word declaration. I'm here because I. Four words. I'm. If you do I'm instead of I am. I'm. I'm here because I. No, you're not in heaven because you did a bloody stinking thing. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even the faith to believe this message was given to you by God. Before you were ever born, the word of God said that who the Lord foreknew he also predestined simply means this God knew from the minute you were born that if the evidence was presented to you for the death burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ whether or not that would be anything that you would accept or reject he knew before you were born and he knew Okay, you know what? Tommy's going to believe this. He'd be willing to believe this. He'd be willing to accept this. So you know what? At this moment in his life, I'm going to put the seed of faith in his heart. Because it's one thing. See, a lot of people don't understand. A lot of people accept the gospel, honestly, at a cognitive level. They accept it from a level of reasoning and thinking. If you think about it for a minute, it's not really that hard a stretch to understand that people could believe that there's a God. People could believe that God uh, did this work, you know, through this man, Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again. People say, well, no, you, you can't believe that at a cognitive level. You, it takes faith to believe that. No, it doesn't. There are people who believe there are aliens floating around on planet Earth. There are people who believe aliens come and plant uh, life in, in mothers here on Earth and their children are born half alien and half human. Am I telling the truth? Are they believing that from a place of faith? Because they have no evidence. Have they ever seen an alien? Have they ever seen a woman implanted with the embryo of an alien baby? No, they've never seen it. But they're believing, listen to me, they're believing what they've heard. They're believing someone else's testimony. They're believing what someone else is saying. Am I telling the truth? Well, I got news for you. The gospel's the same exact thing. We believe what someone else has said. There's not a one of us in the church today that can say we believe the gospel except that we have to also confess, as the Apostle Paul stated, we have believed a true report. Hallelujah. We accept as a true and factual report that Peter, James, and John and the other ten disciples remaining after Judas had killed himself were testifying that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead 
and appeared to his disciples and we believe that message every single believer in the church is only here because we've believed what we've heard am i telling the truth yes i am is it possible to believe the gospel at a you know just at a human thinking level sure it is Sure it is. Why do you think we got so many people who call themselves Christians who don't look or act anything like a Christian? The fruit of the Spirit's not present, so that means the, that the Spirit's not present. Because where the Spirit is, the fruit is. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. Am I telling the truth? So you see, we've got a world today full of people who believe the gospel at a cognitive level. But there's nothing in them that really, really, really wants to live this thing. And God knows it. And for that reason, they were not given the gift of faith. But those who are sincere in coming to God, those who sincerely turn from sin and unbelief to faith in God, guess what? God honors that repentance with faith. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. When you stand before God in the judgment, my friend, He will never, never say, Welcome to heaven because you were able to fill in the blank. But I'll tell you what he may say for many of us. Hallelujah. He may say, point underdog. Hallelujah. Praise the name.